Greetings, salutations, and welcome to a very special edition of Fair Game. This particular Fair Game is a rather unusual one, because we are going to be covering a game I've already previously covered. I'm using a modified version of Snake's Revenge, where I swapped out the joystick font for the classic Metal Gear stencil font. I feel like this better cements the connection between the two games, but I'm also doing this for another reason. There's a number of very interesting things I only learned about Snake's Revenge relatively recently, We'll be discussing everything from story elements to gameplay elements, and I will be doing so in such a way that I hope will at least be marginally entertaining for you. So without further ado, let's begin. Snake's Revenge is a Western-only sequel to the NES version of Metal Gear created by the Castlevania 3 team. While when it was released, it was considered by most to be a very good game, it's been maligned over the years, not the least of which because of its difficulty, and also because it's a game that was made with no input from Hideo Kojima whatsoever. See, Metal Gear on MSX was a groundbreaking title. However, the MSX had absolutely no penetration outside Japan, and even in Japan, the game didn't sell well. So Hideo Kojima basically said, to heck with it, I tried, and moved on to making titles like Snatcher. However, in the 1980s, Konami were known for being port wizards. They were notorious for being able to get arcade titles to work on much weaker hardware, usually without losing too much. Konami saw the possibility in porting the game to the Famicom and ultimately the NES, and wound up giving the source code to the original game to the Castlevania team and basically told them to get it done. Whatever has to be sacrificed to make the game work, do it. Just make the game happen. However, when the ports were done, something unexpected happened. They sold phenomenally well infinitely better than even Konami was hoping to. As a result, the game wound up getting massive penetration in both the West and Japan, despite initially being a flop on the MSX. This actually later saw a secondary market for the MSX version boom, and actually wound up having the title sell considerably better. With the game selling as well as it did, Konami was now interested in an actual follow-up. Konami wound up once again getting the Castlevania team to work on an NES and Famicom-only sequel. Snake's Revenge was intended to be an alternate canon story, and as a result, the Castlevania team wound up approaching Kojima and beseeched him to make an actual sequel for the MSX version of Metal Gear, which he ultimately did, becoming Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake. In essence, Snake's Revenge ultimately wound up being the reason that there was a Metal Gear franchise in the West after the first game. It was Snake's Revenge's devs contacting Kojima directly that led to him creating Metal Gear 2, and Metal Gear 2 was the foundation upon which Metal Gear Solid was ultimately built. Additionally, Snake's Revenge is responsible for a number of gameplay and story innovations that for the most part have become staples in the series thereafter. I'd say that one of the most tragic things about Snake's Revenge is that, in spite of its importance to the series as a whole, and in spite of the fact that it's a damn good game in its own right, it receives an enormous amount of hate. Some of these, I will acknowledge, it absolutely deserves. Those difficulty spikes, for example, are kind of ridiculous. Others, however, not quite so much. For example, I've never really found the side-scrolling areas that objectionable. How quickly oxygen tanks burn down aside. But there is something I've always been wondering about Snake's Revenge over the years. A sort of lingering doubt that's always been there, but I've never really been able to approach. And it's specifically about the story. See, there's an interesting quirk about Snake's Revenge. For all of its problems, it is extremely faithful to Kojima's way of doing things. Integration of gameplay mechanics, for example, and how different parts of the game come together. It's very competent, despite all of its flaws. It is very clear, when you play it, that they were heavily referencing the MSX version of Metal Gear when they were putting this game's mechanics together. And it shows in everything from enemy and boss design to how weapons work. The one area that never seemed to have gotten this treatment was the story, of all things. Which at first seems almost like a bizarre oversight. But then something dawned on me. Might we be looking at an Other M situation here? Ultra Games, the Konami affiliate responsible for localizing Snake's Revenge, was always really well known for the awful job it tended to do with the box and manual of these games, frequently putting in references to pop culture and current events that were never in the original game and don't actually appear anywhere in the games. For example, in both the box and manual of the NES version of Metal Gear, claiming that the main villain was a vermin Katafi, and likewise claiming that the main antagonist of Snake's Revenge was a Hyarola Kai. Before I continue with this train of thought, however, I wanted to take a brief detour in order to show you this little area right here. This area, outside the northern gate of the fortress, is where the silencer spawns a bit later on. This actually directly ties into what I was originally talking about. Thanks to a friend of mine who understands Moonspeak, I was actually able to get a lot more information about the Famicom version of Snake's Revenge. And the original story is a lot more competent and a lot more involved. 
All these story beats are actually in the NES version, but they're not fully elaborated on, and as a result, there's a lot of context that's being missed. So, as it was explained to me, here is the actual story of Snake's Revenge. It's been three years since the fall of Outer Heaven. The various groups that were originally united under Big Boss wound up scattering, and for the most part, things have calmed down quite a bit since then. However, after Outer Heaven's fall, one of the militant groups chose to stick around. While this group was originally not considered much of a threat, mostly because Outer Heaven had been bombed to hell by this point, intelligence operatives who had been scouting out their new base of operations uncovered unsettling reports that this group was planning to move something very, very big to one of the other groups within the next few days. The biggest possible concern is that this group may have actually been able to salvage something from the broken remnants of the TX-55 Metal Gear. With only a few days until the handoff happens, Foxhound's commission is reactivated, and a team is quickly assembled to investigate the base and find out what's going on, and put a stop to it if they're able. The base that we're in right now, and the surrounding jungle area, are actually supposed to be in the same area as the original base from Metal Gear. This is also why the enemies broadly look similar to the ones from that game. Shirtless, gray pants, white helmet. A lot like Metal Gear Solid 2 and 3, Snake's Revenge takes place broadly across two chapters. The first chapter centers around stopping the initial shipment. The second chapter involves penetrating the base that the shipments were being sent to, as well as figuring out who's behind it and ultimately stopping their plan from going forward. While I have no idea if this is the actual way things were supposed to pan out, I'm only going off of someone's explanation of it after all, it does make an absolute ton of things in this game make a hell of a lot more sense both in terms of story and game progression, and to a lesser degree, environment design. But we'll get to it as the individual parts of it come together. Currently, we're in the middle of Building 1. To a Metal Gear veteran, Building 1 of Snake's Revenge feels almost like a return to form, the biggest difference being that if you can successfully beat an enemy in unarmed combat without raising the alarms, there's a chance that they'll drop either rations or ammunition. This is an essential mechanic in Snake's Revenge because, for the most part, supply rooms are non-existent. Here's another thing I found out from the same friend who gave me the information on Snake's Revenge's story. That silencer I was talking about that appears suddenly at the North Gate? Nick stole it from the enemy and put it there for you. And you can only find out about it through this easily missable codec call. I'm willing to bet that there's a lot of similar calls like this hidden in the game. This furthers my theory that Snake's Revenge's biggest problem, at least as far as its story goes, is a mixture of bad translation and conveyance. See, Metal Gear's story on NES, despite the bad translation, was still kind of groundbreaking for its era. The way that your commanding officer ultimately turns out to be the last boss of the game is brilliant and was unprecedented at the time. It makes every other weirdness of the game come into context. Why you were sent in with no equipment, why it was he was always slightly too late when you ran into a death trap of some sort. We look back at them now and we think of these things as quaint, but at the time, this kind of story progression had never been done in video games before. It had been done in movies, but never video games. Take a look two years later at Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake, and that kind of storytelling is outright revolutionary. Snake's Revenge, in contrast, never really had that kind of chance. The context wasn't as unambiguous, and people who played the original Metal Gear would be waiting for any kind of twist. When you meet the boss of the train way later on in the game, it's obvious, because it's playing off the same tropes you've already run into back in the original Metal Gear. All it really would have taken is a bit more love and attention, and maybe a little bit more text, and I think Snake's Revenge's story could have hit the same beats. We don't get enough time with either John or Nick, not even through their Kodak calls. As a result, the rather somber feel of Snake's Revenge's ending doesn't really feel as earned as it does with Metal Gear 2, despite them having very similar story beats in their own right. John Turner is never seen again after the initial infiltration, and Nick Meyer dies sneaking card key 8 out to Snake. These don't have the same emotional weight as the death of Gustavo or Gray Fox, and I have to wonder how much of it was just due to the NES's limitations at the time. Snake's Revenge focuses so much on the technical side of things. The graphics are better, the game engine is much more coherent, but that came at a price of size, and I wonder if... There's just more that could have been done. Snake's Revenge has the skeleton of a fantastic story under everything. I sometimes wish that we had the ability to remake this game, or at the very least, ROM hack it out to its full potential. Sadly, I don't think we're ever gonna see it again. A lot of the Metal Gear fandom considers Snake's Revenge to be a black mark on the series' honor, despite the fact that, in all regards, the game is literally responsible for the franchise continuing to exist in the West. It got very high marks when it first released, and I would consider it even to this day to be a very good NES game, just shy of being great. That's one of the reasons I wanted to do this again and cover this game, if only for this one episode. Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake was 
legendary. But the West would not get an official port of that game until 2007. 13 years after it got released. I think the fact that the West never got Metal Gear 2 is a big reason that Metal Gear Solid references it so heavily. And I'm not talking little references, there are parts of Metal Gear Solid that reference Metal Gear 2 beat for beat. And yet, there's quite a few things that were stolen directly from Snake's Revenge that don't get any credit whatsoever. The two-chapter format that was later used in Metal Gear Solid 2 and 3? Yeah, that started with Snake's Revenge. Starting Armed, something that was used in Metal Gear Solid 2, 3, and pretty much every game to follow? Yeah, that started with Snake's Revenge. None of this is to say that Snake's Revenge isn't a game without flaws, because it absolutely is. I'd say the three biggest ones it has are, first of all, that it is a very linear game compared to your average Metal Gear game. Due to the two-chapter format and the comparatively limited resources of the NES at the time, if you boil down a lot of the Metal Gear games, a lot of them are almost as linear, but because of their design, they tend to be more free-roaming and open-ended. Snake's Revenge doesn't really allow for this. It's a little bit too narrow in its focus. I'd say the second problem that Snake's Revenge has is, again, tied to the story issues from earlier. Nothing is really explained, and even a little bit of extra dialogue and information would have really gone a long way in fleshing this game out. I would have loved to hear more about the bosses in this game, because they are completely outrageous and a lot of them are really well designed. Finally, the third, and I would argue most crippling of all the weaknesses of Snake's Revenge, is the difficulty. It is not consistent. Not remotely. Part of this is entirely a product of its age, I want to point out. It was true for both PC and NES games at the time to have a sequel or expansion that was just ridiculously hard for no reason. I think the mentality going into it was something along the lines of, well, you beat it, so you're obviously an expert, so here you go, expert. Which isn't to say it's all bad, either. Snake's Revenge has some legitimately challenging boss fights that are actually really well done. When you finally get to Building 6, the final area of the game, the game starts introducing alternate hit squads with secondary elite enemies that will show up in addition to the main enemies. The traps get more clever and more sadistic. It really feels like a worthy challenge by the time you actually get there, which is kind of interesting for a game like this. The original Metal Gear, in both the MSX version and in the NES version, get easier the further along you get in them. This is because as your rank improves, you get more wiggle room through a larger health bar and a larger supply pool, and you're constantly adding new equipment to your inventory. Snake's Revenge, meanwhile, remains legitimately difficult up until the end, even with the added equipment. And your rank in Snake's Revenge can actually go higher than that in Metal Gear, so you have an even bigger health pool and even more equipment storage. I think it helps a lot that Snake's Revenge has actual boss fights, as opposed to Metal Gear's, well, this kind of qualifies as a boss fight. There are bosses in the original Metal Gear that you can just flat out bypass if you have enough rations. Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake would fix this with much better boss fights, but Snake's Revenge still did it first. I mean, that's one of the sad parts of Snake's Revenge right there, is that we're never going to officially know how much influence it had on the series, because Kojima's completely disowned it. And since I don't think Snake's Revenge is ever likely to be re-released, it's only through emulation that this thing avoids being memory hold entirely. But since I wanted to give you a really good example of some bad design in Snake's Revenge, there's this room right here. One of two absolutely miserable rooms in Building 1. It is almost impossible to either slip by or kill these guys without getting caught and sounding an alarm. I've done it, and even then, I can tell you, it all boils down to luck. Perhaps even more ridiculous, however, you don't actually need to go down this route at all. The only thing that you'll find down this way is an officer that you can interrogate. Now, interrogated officers count towards the rescued percentage, and obviously that'll count towards rank. The problem is, it's impossible to get above rank 2 before the end of the ship, and beating the ship will automatically set you at rank 3, so saving the guy is completely pointless. While there are a few cases of Snake's Revenge doing things like this, there's also a bunch of cases of idiot proofing that you wouldn't expect there to be. For example, if you miss the silencer that Nick gave you outside the North Gate, you can actually get it again in Munition Compound 2. If you miss any critical items early in the game, on the supply train, there's a locked room that will only open if you missed any of them, and will have what you need. It will only open up after you beat the train boss, however, so you have to bear that in mind. Snake's Revenge is actually loaded with little things like that that you wouldn't know about unless you actively went looking for them. For example, the size of the hit squad that shows up when you get spotted by the enemy is directly proportional to your rank. The higher your rank, the larger the hit squad that comes after you. One of the biggest reasons that I think everything has remained so nebulous, especially when it comes to the story, however, is the fact that while the game was originally developed to have a Famicom release, that ultimately never materialized. It wound up being a Western-only release. While the intended Famicom port was eventually released via emulation later, 
the Japanese only box, book, and any supplemental materials, and really anything that could have given us any sort of answers or insight on anything, especially the story, ultimately never materialized. Anyway, here's another great example of really bad game design in Snake's Revenge. This is a gas-covered room. There is no gas mask in Snake's Revenge. This is bad enough, but virtually every oxygen tank in the game is protected by a similar trap. And oxygen tanks are an item that you are always in need of for the side-scrolling areas, disappear very quickly when they're actually in use, and every single time you want a new one, you have to restock in a room like this. I have a feeling that originally there was a gas mask intended to be in the game, or maybe the oxygen tanks were usable as a defensive measure, but they took that out for some reason, and this is the result. Humorously, when you get it, the body armor actually reduces the damage you take from the poison gas. Because why not? We are almost done with building one now, it's just a matter of farming up some additional materials, and then we'll, we'll be making our way to the boss. Also a really great example of me getting entirely too confident and almost screwing the pooch on this one. I've actually been quite good at avoiding sounding alarms on this run, especially when it comes to things that normally you'd easily get caught by, like the searchlights outside the base. But certain old habits die hard, as you can see here. We're gonna be farming up plastic explosives right here, and that's because plastic explosives are actually the best weapon to use against this first boss. I was kinda surprised to learn this myself. Plastic explosives actually have the highest damage output of any weapon in Snake's Revenge, actually, doing 14 damage per blast. To compare, a pistol bullet does 3 damage. Knife also does 3, submachine gun does 3, punch does 1, Shotgun does 6 damage per pellet, but an enemy can only be hit by the shotgun once, no matter how many pellets hit. Most of the other explosive weapons do 9 damage. The exception is the remote control missile, which does 11 damage. Most of the elite enemies that you wind up running into in Building 6 have 6 HP as opposed to 3 HP, like the guards. And here's a bit of a classic scenario that's given a new Snake's Revenge twist. The cameras in Snake's Revenge work exactly like the cameras in Metal Gear, but with one exception. There's no blind spot directly under them. As a result, being able to slip past the cameras in Snake's Revenge is heavily a matter of being able to exploit cover. Not too hard to beat with a little bit of practice, though. Down here, we can find grenades, another classic item, which is kind of ported from the original Metal Gear. Metal Gear had the grenade launcher, whereas Snake's Revenge has frag grenades. The biggest difference, aside from the fact that the frag grenades are their own separate pickup, is that the splash damage in Snake's Revenge actually works. This one change actually does so much to make grenades better in Snake's Revenge. Like, no lie, you'll wind up using them all the time, even when you really didn't expect to. Stocking up on supplies while we're here. There's not a terribly huge amount needed for this area, but you definitely want to make sure that you're maxed out on ammo and rations before you start heading out. The next room has a really sneaky camera trap that you have to bypass. The secret to doing it is to leave the room immediately, back out, go to the top of the room, and then go back in. As long as you're quick about it, you won't get detected because the camera on the back wall does not go all the way to the top. Snake's Revenge is loaded with sneaky camera tricks like this, especially in the side-scrolling areas. Don't worry, we'll get to it. One interesting quirk that Snake's Revenge has that the original Metal Gear didn't have is that it actively keeps track of where you are. In the original Metal Gear, your spawn location depended entirely on your rank. At rank 1, you'd start at the drop zone where you start at the beginning of the game. At rank 2, you'll start outside building 1. At rank 3, you'll start inside building 1's elevator. And at rank 4, you'll start outside the back of building 1. Forget about any of that crap for Snake's Revenge, however. Snake's Revenge treats any time you visit an elevator as a save point, basically. So if you get a password from that point, you'll start at that particular elevator. And we are now on the move into the very first side-scrolling area of the game. This generally represents a pretty big difficulty spike because this type of gameplay is not one you're usually familiar with. Honestly, objectively, I don't think it's a particularly bad gameplay choice. We had side areas in the previous Metal Gear game in the elevators. This is just an interesting new take on them. I'd say my biggest issue with the side-scrolling areas, by far, is how quickly air tanks run out. Due to a programming issue, the very first one that you get basically starts empty. On top of this, each one lasts maybe about seven and a half seconds. The most infamous of all of the side-scrolling areas is the one at the end of Compound 1. Namely because it is dominated by a gigantically long tunnel that you have to crawl through. 
Not only is this tunnel completely flooded, and as a result, you're going to have to use your air tanks throughout the entire thing, but there are multiple barricades that have to be cleared with explosives, which will force you to delay and cause you to run down on air tanks even faster. I'd say it represents the single most blatantly unfair and brutal difficulty spike in the entire game. And considering that Snake's Revenge is kind of known for its difficulty spikes, that's saying a lot. It is, however, eminently beatable, especially if you have a little bit of patience and you know what you're doing. Building one side-scrolling area is actually kind of nasty in its own right, but for a very different reason. The second that you're done with this one, you wind up facing the first boss. And the first boss in Snake's Revenge is not an easy one. And speak of the devil, let's get right into it, because here is the first boss, the Quarterback Mercenaries. Yes, that is their actual name. Now, I don't do such a great job of it here. I admit my movement is not quite up to code. However, if you know what you're doing, it is entirely possible to beat these guys without taking a hit, and I've seen one of my friends do it. The key is to move forward a little bit, bait them out, then run backwards and then along the wall. If you do it correctly, which I only managed to do a few times during this run because I'm still learning the hang of it, they won't hit you and you can use this strategy to leave plastic explosives in their path to explode when they get close. Three bombs will take one of them out, and that is vastly quicker than trying to take them out with handguns or anything else. Each of these mercenaries has 40 health, and they get slightly easier each time one goes down. A younger Jameis used to just simply try to burst them down with handgun ammo, and this is a terrible idea. There's about a quarter second worth of invulnerability that they have for every hit that they take from the pistol or submachine gun. You can also wing grenades at them, which will also work, and will take them down in about five hits each. Either way, for the less skilled or less lucky, this particular battle is rather brutal in its own right, often resulting in something of a slugfest. If you add up their individual HP counts, 40 each, they actually have the second most amount of HP of any boss in this entire game. The only one higher is technically the final actual boss of the game. I think it's very telling that even when I'm conceptually doing things the right way, I'm still managing to screw up this boss often. My original way of doing it, which you can see me doing in my previous run of it, and is not the right way to do it, but still works, is to burst down one of the mercenaries with your handgun in order to give you an opening. This would work, but it would ultimately wind up with me taking a lot of damage and ultimately turning the boss fight into something of a damage race. I'd say the third boss is Snake's Revenge's best known damage race boss, and while it is possible to beat that boss without getting hit, most will not do so for the simple reason that it is a giant pain in the ass to do. Anyway, while it's been an absolutely brutal fight, here we are at the end of the boss fight, and we are none the worse. Well, alright, we burned off a lot of rations and supplies, but the point is, they're all dead and we're not. We're not too far away from the port and the ship, which is the second major area of the game. Just an elevator ride and a few short rooms, and we'll be at the port itself. However, before we get to the port, there is one last enemy that we have to deal with that is quite possibly the strangest enemy slash obstacle in the entirety of Snake's Revenge, and that's saying a lot. That enemy is the door blocker. Taking the form of a pair of blocks that quickly slams shut in front of one of the doors, this obstacle's whole purpose is just to obstruct you. If you touch it, you'll take damage and go flying backwards across the room. It also has a completely ludicrous 84 HP, and is only vulnerable to three weapons. The three weapons that can damage it are the punch, which does one damage, the knife, which does three, and the plastic explosives, which do their full 14. Six plastic explosives, or around 30 knife stabs, are usually enough to take it out. Without further ado, we are now at the port, and officially at the end of this first chapter of this run. I've been Jameis, and I hope that you enjoy this little stream of consciousness I've been able to share with you, courtesy of Snake's Revenge. Thank you for tuning in, and I hope to see you the next time. I will be trying to crank out stuff that isn't more GBO2 content in a bit, though you will see a lot more of that from me too.